All right, just giving it a, another minute to see if more people are filing in. Okay, let's uh, maybe go ahead and get started. So, um, hello and welcome to the Institute for Molecular Science and Engineering's webinar uh, titled Leonardo da Vinci's Virgin of the Rocks and Art and AI. Uh, my name is Nathan Daly. Um, I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the National Gallery. Um, so I wanted to say that today's event is also supported by the Science and Engineering Research for Cultural Heritage Network of Excellence, and that all of the webinars in this series um, are aimed at addressing science and engineering research for cultural heritage. There will be some useful links put into the chat function, which include links to the IMSC Eventbrite page, where you can find the registration for all the upcoming webinars, the IMSC YouTube channel, where all of the previous webinars have been uploaded, um, the IMSC blog, the Never Lick the Spoon podcast, all of the previous briefing papers, and um, registration for the IMSC newsletter so that you can keep up to date with all of the IMSC news and events. So just a few tips to make sure that we can have a seamless webinar. Um, if everyone can please make sure that your microphone and video are switched off. Um, if you would like to ask a question, please put your question in the Q&A function at any time during the webinar and your questions will be answered at the end. Um, please. Uh, don't put questions in the chat function. Um, if you do have any te technical difficulties, please message IMSC Imperial privately, and I can try and help as well where possible. Um, so I'm now going to introduce our two presenters, uh, Dr. Catherine Higgett and Professor Pierre Luigi Dragotti, and then I will hand over to the two of them to give their presentations. So our first speaker, um, Dr. Catherine Higgett, is Principal Scientist at the National Gallery. She has a PhD in chemistry from the University of York and joined the scientific department in 1999 as an organic analyst specializing in the study of paint binding media using a combination of spectroscopic and chromatographic techniques. Between 2007 and 2015, she was head of science at the British Museum, gaining experience working with a wider variety of materials and handling data acquired using a very broad range of analytical and imaging techniques. Then in 2015, she returned to the National Gallery as principal scientist, helping to extend the range of analytical and imaging approaches available for the study of paintings. As a majority of the methods she employs, whether on microsamples or in situ on paintings, uh, generate 3D data cubes, she's increasingly concerned with how best to interrogate, interpret, and present this data, as well as possibilities to combine data sets to enrich understanding. She has extensive experience in the application and publication of her research for different academic audiences, including both art historical and scientific, as well as to the wider public. Our second speaker, um, Professor Pierre Luigi Dragotti, is a professor of signal processing in the electrical and electronic engineering department at Imperial College and is also a fellow of the IEEE. Uh, Professor Dragotti was technical co chair for the European Signal Processing Conference in 2012 associate editor of the IEEE Transactions on Image Processing from 2006 to 2009, elected member of the IEEE Image, Video, and Multidimensional Signal Processing Technical Committee, as well as being an elected member of the IEEE Signal Processing Theory and Methods Technical Committee and the IEEE Computational Imaging Technical Committee. He was also a recipient of an ERC Starting Investigator Award for the Project RICOSAMP and Currently, he is Editor-in-Chief of the IEEE Transactions on Signal Processing and an IEEE SPS Distinguished Lecturer. His research in interests include sampling theory, wavelet theory and its applications, sparsity-driven signal processing with application in image super-resolution, neuroscience, and field estimation using sensor networks. So with that, I am going to hand over to our two speakers. Um, I hope everybody can see some slides now. Um, I'm hoping that Nathan will shout if, if he can't. <laughs> so, um, good afternoon. Um, my name is Catherine Higgett, and as Nathan said, I'm a scientist working at the National Gallery, and I want to talk to you uh, about the technical examination of paintings, focusing particularly on Leonardo's Virgin of the Rocks, 
and to provide an introduction to the talk that follows in which Pierre-Luigi Dragotti will discuss how novel signal and image processing and AI techniques are helping to provide new ways to investigate such artworks. But stepping back a moment, why do we undertake technical examination of paintings? There are three main reasons. To support art historical research, to interpret and contextualize the collection, and so here we might be interested in the materials an artist chose to use, their working technique, evolution of the design, questions of attribution. To help conserve and care for the collection, so understanding how painting has changed over time, either through deliberate interventions or just changes that occur as materials age and deteriorate, so that decisions can be made to help preserve such collections. And finally, to share and present the collection, whether with scholars, researchers or the general public. If we look at an image of a painting, there's a tendency to think of it as a 2D object. However, if a tiny microsample is taken at a given location and mounted in cross-section, we can see that this is far from the case. In this sample taken from the Virgin's mantle, we see a priming layer, a layer of preliminary drawing, and then multiple superimposed layers of paint, each of which represents an intimate mixture of pigments in an organic binder. Samples like this allow us to very precisely understand and analyse all the materials present at this location and how the various layers are built up. It provides us with the ground truth at this location. However, sampling is an invasive process and can only tell us about the materials present at that particular point. It's also possible to use various types of imaging using different kinds of radiation to provide a non-invasive way to capture information about an entire painting. Providing information about where things are spatially distributed across the painting, even if not necessarily so much information about what materials were used. Depending on the type of radiation used, these methods can give us information about features at or below the surface of the painting and can reveal hidden features, including the preliminary sketches or underdrawings used by artists in developing a composition or changes made during the painting process. These are the traditional imaging methods that have been used to study the Virgin of the Rocks before our recent study in January 2019. When infrared reflectography was first carried out in 2004, in addition to lines of underdrawing associated with the composition we see today, a completely different earlier composition, which was drawn but not painted, was discovered beneath the paint surface. Above the current Virgin's head, there is the head of another figure of the Virgin facing towards the right. I hope here you can see the eye, and her hand is also visible here on her chest. A careful, was tracing, a careful tracing was made of the lines in the infrared image that belongs to this composition, which we've called Composition A, and it shows a figure of the Virgin with her right arm outstretched. She's looking to her left and slightly down, and although she must have been intended to be adoring the Christ child, no other figures could be deciphered. Two versions of the Virgin of the Rock exists, and prior to the work I'm about to present, it was generally accepted that the National Gallery's version was started in the early 1490s for the altar in San Francesco Grande in Milan, although it was not finally finished and installed until 1508. The painting in the Louvre was thought to be the first version, painted in the years immediately after Leonardo and the De Paredes brothers initially received the commission from the confraternity at San Francesco Grande in April 18, uh, 1483. This painting appears to have been the subject of a dispute and was never installed and was eventually sold. The drawing for the first composition beneath the National Gallery painting is very important, therefore, in understanding the relationship between these two versions and their relative chronology. In the years that have passed since these earlier studies, there have been significant technological advances and a range of spectroscopic imaging techniques are becoming increasingly widely adopted in the heritage sector. Such techniques are able to address both of the needs described earlier and in a non-invasive way. These methods effectively record a spectrum at each pixel, allowing materials characterization at each point across a painting and the production of maps showing the distribution of these materials. <clears throat> the spectroscopic imaging approaches generate huge, complex, multi-dimensional data sets from entire artworks. However, it must be remembered that the signal that is recorded at each point can, depending on the type of spectroscopy involved, include contributions for some or all of the materials and layers at that location. So the signal that re is recorded is mixed and is not from a single pixel, but a voxel. Thus interpreting these signals to characterize the materials present or to visualize particular features of interest is highly challenging. There are two spectroscopic imaging techniques that are proving particularly valuable, macro X-ray fluorescence scanning and reflectance imaging spectroscopy, also known as hyperspectral imaging, and the National Gallery is quite unusual in having both available in-house. 
In 2017, the gallery acquired its Macro XRF scanner, which is a commercially available system. The gallery were early adopters of this technology, but after an investment in heritage science infrastructure funded by the AHRC earlier this year, these methods are set to become much more widely used in the heritage sector. For reflectance imaging spectroscopy, we've constructed our own high specification system based on that built at the National Gallery of Art in Washington. In 2019, uh, in January 2019, we had the opportunity to carry out the new imaging on the Leonardo, and we were very keen to see if these methods could help us get further in understanding the complex evolution of this painting. X-ray fluorescence scanning is an X-ray based, based technique, and it works by collecting a spectrum pixel by pixel while scanning across the painting. The spectrum tells us about what chemical elements are present at that pixel and in what relative quantities. This data can then be used to produce a map of each of the chemical elements present in the painting, both at and below the surface with submillimeter resolution, with the various chemical elements being associated with specific pigments. So here at the right, we have a lead map showing where the pigment lead white has been used, with the lighter areas indicating high concentration and the darker areas lower concentrations. We can scan an area of 80 by 60 centimetres in size. And so we had to scan the Leonardo in sections. And in fact, because we found something very interesting, we repeated it at higher resolution. The data was then processed to produce the individual element maps, and these were then joined together to make the final images. And here we have the full set of chemical element maps that were produced. For interpreting these and identifying specific pigments, we were fortunate to be able to draw on additional evidence from the analysis of paint samples prepared as cross-sections. In taking samples from paintings, a very tiny sample is taken with a scalpel. And here we have a typical one photographed under a microscope. It's only about a quarter of a pinhead in size. This is then embedded in resin and then ground away so that we cut through the layers to give a cross-section through the paint layers. And then from this, we can not only see the build-up of the different paint layers, but also identify and analyse the pigments. Here I show some of the cross sections from the Virgin of the Rocks and the pigments that have been identified in them. At this time, of course, the paints were not bought ready made, but would have been prepared in the studio by grinding the powdered pigment with an oil. So going back now to the XRF maps, here we have the map for copper. This element is strong in the Virgin's cloak and in the distant landscape at the left, where it's associated with blue copper carbonate mineral azurite. We know from the paint samples I've just showed you that this pigment was used for the underlayers of this drapery and for the water in the back of the scene. There is also some copper elsewhere in the background at lower levels where the green copper acetate pigment verdigris is a component of the paint mixtures. In the zinc map um, shown here, we can also see that some zinc is present in the blue cloak. And in fact, zinc is a fairly common impurity in natural azurite pigments. Rather more surprisingly though, it was clear that the lines of the drawing for composition A also contain zinc. You can see here, if we zoom in, um, that the head and the hands of the Virgin from composition A, I'm showing this next to the infrared reflectogram so you can see the correlation between the lines seen in the reflectogram and the zinc containing lines. Even more remarkably though, at the right of the painting in what is now an area of rocks in the background landscape, the zinc map is showing the missing Christ child and an unanticipated figure of an angel. Unfortunately, in X-ray fluorescent spectroscopy, the signal for zinc partly overlaps that for copper. And so the angel and the baby can be seen more easily when the copper map is partially subtracted from the zinc map. This is the first time we found a material containing zinc used for the underdrawing in a painting. It's really unusual and this is something I'll come back to later. I should also add that generating this map was very challenging and required a lot of very manual data processing and manipulation. We are trying to here to map an element present in very low quantities, in very thin lines of underdrawing and covered by multiple paint layers. In his talk, Pierluigi will discuss a novel approach that, it, that was developed within a joint research project, Arctic, so art through the ICT lens, to try and improve and automate the XRF data processing. Once we knew where the angel and baby were on the painting, we realised that we could just about see them in the infrared reflectogram. So the angel's face, shoulder and wings are visible. So the chin and the nose are here, as well as the baby's head with the left eye just visible here, though it's still very hard to see. 
So we were very interested to investigate this with our reflectance imaging spectroscopy system, as this goes deeper into the infrared range than conventional reflectography. And we were hoping that this might reveal more of this first composition. The painting had to be scanned as a series of strips as shown. What is so powerful with reflectance imaging spectroscopy is that from the data set, we can produce a series of contiguous images every few nanometers over the wavelength range of interest. So around 500 images in this case, um, in the range from 1000 to 2500 nanometers. In this case, though, the approach didn't reveal anything very different to normal infrared reflectography when the individual images were examined. But something else that we can do with reflectance imaging spectroscopy data is to apply various mathematical processing methods to bring out features relating to certain materials or combinations of materials. It was this approach that turned out to be really helpful here. And in the image on the right, we have one of the minimum noise fraction transform or MNF images, where we can start to see the angel more clearly and especially the baby's eye here in the detail inserted at the bottom right. In fact, the eyes, both eyes are now visible. And in another of the MNF images, uh, again shown on the right, we can see the whole figure group much more clearly. We can also see really the very fluid character of these drawing lines um, that Leonardo was applying. The baby's eye that we could see with the previous MNF image, however, can't be seen in this one. And in fact, we found that different MNF images brought out different features. So each was studied in turn and the lines seen in each image were combined in a tracing to help us to see the features of the figures. And in the face and the arm, um, some very fine lines could be seen in the zinc map that weren't visible in the um, MNF images. So if we add these as well to the tracing, we get the image shown in the center, providing a more complete sense of the angel and baby in composition A. And here on the right, I show that tracing overlaid in the correct position um, on a detail from the final painting. The angel with its locks of hair visible on either side of the face looks down on the baby who holds his right arm up, with his left arm down by his side. His left leg is tucked underneath him. Uh, the line marked with the red arrow here is the front of his bent knee and his, left, uh, his right leg is out to his side and in front of him. The Christ child's pose is similar to that in this antique marble statue of a boy with a goose, now in Uffizi, but which was owned by Lorenzo de' Medici and would have been known to Leonardo. In the underdrawing, the baby's head is in a three quarter position and looking up. And if we take a small detail of the MNF image that showed the baby's eyes well and insert it in the correct position in the MNF image that shows the composition A virgin's head most clearly, we can finally see what the virgin first identified in 2004 is actually looking at. This unambiguous depiction of Christ's gaze towards the virgin and vice versa may be significant for the question of whether this first composition ever included St John the Baptist with all this might mean for its iconography. But coming back now to the question of what the zinc containing material used for this first drawing might be, we do have a couple of paint cross sections that include the drawing lines seen in the zinc XRF map. These drawing lines can be seen as, as the dark, thin dark layer lying directly on top of the bottom layer of gesso. The individual black particles are visible in what seems to be a yellow brown medium in line with the fluid nature of the drawing that we can see in the MNF images. Energy dispersive X-ray analysis in the scanning electron microscope of this cross section showed that the underdrawing layer contains some iron. And a spot spectrum from this layer shows that there is indeed some zinc present as well. And in some locations, there's also a little copper. As I mentioned earlier, this is the first time we found zinc in underdrawing for a painting. But zinc containing materials have been found in the context of drawings on paper, including those by Leonardo. An example is this drawing in the British Museum where two types of iron gall ink have been used, with both of the inks found to contain not just iron, but also zinc and minor amounts of copper. The use of an impure iron vitriol to make the ink would account for the presence of the zinc and copper. It therefore seems likely that Leonardo made use of an iron gall ink that contained some zinc, which he applied with a brush when drawing composition A on the panel. Um, but going back to the technical imaging, we then combined all of the information we had from all of the different technical images into one tracing, uh, this being an entirely manual process, giving us the results shown on the left. As we can see, we now, if we now compare it to the tracing made in 2005, how much further we go, have got in understanding this first idea for the composition. 
if we just focus on the figure of the Virgin in our tracing, so the, thing, the image shown on the left, with this more complete view that we now have of the figure, its relationships already noted in earlier research with this detail of a drawing by Leonardo from the Royal Collection in Windsor, shown in the centre, and his unfinished St Jerome shown on the left, now in the Vatican Museum. This relationship is even clearer than it was before. This is particularly evident with Jerome with his outstretched right arm and left arm folded in. However, if we remove um, those lines from the tracing that do not contain zinc, the revised tracing now does not include the outstretched arm, so this is the image shown in the centre, suggesting a different material was used to draw this arm that doesn't contain zinc. And among the MNF images too, there seemed to be some evidence for there being two types of drawing material, since some MNF images seem to emphasise the bolder lines that appear to correlate to the zinc containing lines seen in the XRF. And in the image, MNF images that, that tend to emphasise these bold lines, the outstretched arm is again absent. So Leonardo was perhaps experimenting with different poses for the Virgin, much as he does in this series of tiny studies on this sheet at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, which have already been connected to the development of ideas for the Virgin of the Rock. The drawing on the right of the sheet, for example, shows the Virgin with both arms folded in, which is perhaps what we're seeing um, in the tracing from the Virgin of the Rocks. There is some kind of sense too that these broader, stronger lines for the drapery seen in the MNF images and in the zinc map firming up the idea of the figure so that this particular pose was what he was moving towards at a more developed stage in the drawing and away from the design with the outstretched arm. And what we found out about the first compositional idea is only half the story. The new imaging also gave insight into the development of the second painted composition during the course of its production, which was significant in understanding its relationship to the Paris painting. The Paris painting is close, but not identical to the London painting. The traditional view is that there was a common design first used for the Paris painting in the 1480s and then for the second composition uh, in the London painting in the 1490s. Unfortunately, I don't have time to go into this uh, today, but what has emerged is that significant changes were made to the London version during painting before reaching the final images we see it now. And these suggest that perhaps the London painting um, was actually started in the 1480s. Initially was the, comp the drawing for composition A, which was then rejected in favour of a fresh start with the design of the second composition being drawn and developed on the London panel. At least some underpaint then seems to have been applied and revisions to the design were made before it was then used as the basis for the Paris version. Work on the two versions may then have continued in parallel in the studio for a while, a practice known in Leonardo's workshop. However, the unfinished London painting then seems to be left aside for some years, while the Paris painting was brought to completion. In the 1490s, Leonardo then appears to have returned to the London painting, finally completing this in 1506 to 8, when it was then installed um, in the old piece. This tentative hypothesis is based on a technical examination only, but as always, this now needs to be interrogated in an art historical context, especially in connection with the extensive archival documents for the commission of this altar piece, since it challenges the current established assumptions. This study also highlights the wealth of information contained within the huge spectroscopic imaging data sets we're now able to produce, particularly when the different imaging modalities are combined. The work I've just discussed was largely done manually or using relatively simple statistical methods and was very labour intensive. But with this abundance of data, this is also an area where the use of AI, machine learning and other state of the art data driven approaches to interrogate these data sets has the potential to really help our work and provide new insights. And this was part of the motivation behind establishing the collaboration with Imperial and University College London and starting the Arctic project I mentioned earlier. I will now hand over to Pierre Luigi to talk more about this work, but would also like to acknowledge the team of colleagues from the Scientific and Conservation Departments of the National Gallery with whom I worked on the study presented here, and also to note where this work has just been published. And thank you for your attention, and I will now hand the screen back to Pierre Luigi, or at least try to. There we go. Thank you, Catherine. Okay. Let me try and see whether I can share my screen. Okay, 
yes, I think you can see my screen. Okay, so um, here what I'm going to do is to sort of highlight some of the uh, uh, algorithm that uh, we've been developing to address some of the questions that uh, Catherine has uh, highlighted during uh, uh, her talk. Uh, and uh, sorry, let me, yes, okay. And as you can, uh, sorry, give me one second. Okay, yeah. So as you might have appreciated from the previous talk, uh, the heritage sector now is able to collect a lot of uh, data, large amount of data in particular using these novel imaging techniques. And the data is often multimodal. Uh, for example, you can have the visible, the X-ray, the spectral XRF, which were mentioned before. And all this data calls for uh, you know, automatic method that facilitate the interrogation of these data sets, the extractions of uh, important features, which are should be accessible to, let's say, uh, people who are not expert with uh, uh, algorithms. Uh, and also, we need to develop automatic algorithms which are interpretable so that uh, uh, the uh, users can really understand what the algorithm is doing. Now, if I just think of algorithms in general, we uh, separate them into two broad families. A family of algorithms which we call model-based or physics-driven uh, algorithms. And these type of uh, methods essentially are designed based on a set of laws, physical laws, based on our understanding, for example, of the way the data is formed. Uh, so our understanding of these uh, imaging techniques. And so we use all these type of prior knowledge to sort of constrain the algorithm and make sure that it does exactly what we expect uh, to do. So it's a sort of much more controlled type of approach, which leads to algorithms which are much more predictable. The problem is that there are contexts in which the physics behind the problem that we're trying to to address or the modeling of the problem is so complex that we are not able really to come up with a precise model. And then in these cases, we ask the algorithm to learn the model directly from the data. So these are normally called data-driven method, but uh, more broadly, we sometimes call these AI algorithm, which use artificial intelligence or machine learning type of method, because here we have the machine, or if you're on the computer that learns uh, uh, the models directly from uh, the data. So in this talk, I'm going to present two problems. One is really focused on the uh, um, Virgin of the Rocks of the Leonardo da Vinci. And so our algorithm to extract uh, uh, chemical maps from XRF data. Uh, and this, as I'll show you later on, is really what we would call a model-based uh, uh, method. So it's a case where we can model the signal that we see very precisely, and then we can drive an algorithm based on that. And then I'll talk about a different problem, which is uh, a demixing problem in which we try to separate to separate the two X-ray images, which are mixed. Uh, and here we use multimodal uh, data, so visible and uh, X-ray. And the method that we developed is a data-driven type of method or based on artificial intelligence. So let me spend a few words on the uh, XRF and how the data is formed in order for us to appreciate at high level, at least the type of algorithm that then we developed uh, to uh, uh, extract elemental maps from XRF data. So in XRF, as sort of highlighted before, what happens is that we illuminate one region of the uh, uh, painting uh, uh, using an X-ray source. So there is a beam which illuminates that region and the beam can go deep in the region, so it can get information from what is on the surface, but also underneath the surface. Now, what happens is that when the beam illuminates the region, then uh, uh, if there are some chemical elements, and this is, let's say, the atomic composition, then the beam may eject some electrons present in the uh, atom at a certain energy level, at a certain shell. So it creates a hole, which is then uh, filled by another electron, which is at a higher energy. So the electron goes from higher energy to lower energy. And the, as a consequence of that, it generates some fluorescence radiation. And this fluorescence radiation is collected. And sort of the frequency at which this happens really depends on the atomic composition and therefore really on the chemical element over which this is happened. That means that for different chemical elements, you have a radiation at a different frequency. And all these radiations are collected by the device. And therefore, the device produces a 1D signal for this single pixel. And the signal is like a stream of pulses. And the location of each of these pulses encapsulates the information of which chemical element is present at this point 
or underneath that point. And then the process is repeated in a raster scanning fashion so that we can collect data for the entire painting. And so we end up with a volumetric data, a little bit as I highlighted before, where remember for each region here, the signal that we see across uh, 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 frequencies here is a signal that looks like this one here. So it's a stream of pulses, but obviously there is also a lot of noise and some of these pulses are very smooth. Now, the location of the pulses is going to tell us which chemical elements are present at this point and underneath the surface of that point. We have access to a table with all chemical elements, and we know what is the expected location of the pulses per chemical element. So for example, maybe we detect this pulse here, and when we look at the location here, we discover that it's maybe related to this location, and so that means that this pulse is probably bromium and maybe also this other pulse belongs to bromium. Therefore, that would mean that that chemical element is present in that uh, uh, location. So uh, what we'd like to do then is given this uh, sort of complicated data cube, we want to extract. So to detect all the pulses, localize them and map them to the corresponding chemical element in order to create maps of all the chemical elements uh, uh, that are present in the painting. This process is known as XRF deconvolution, and this is the type of results that we achieve uh, if we that we expect to achieve if we run the, the method. So uh, we extract chemical maps uh, for the entire painting. Uh, as I said before, normally uh, the curator tries to extract this information through manual intervention. So playing with the data manually, which can be obviously time consuming, but also in some sense, a bit unreliable and we'd like to have a consistent approach so that one can get some results that can uh, the curator can have a lot of confidence with. So we want to develop an automatic approach that can locate and detect the pulses and given these can identify the element, chemical element which is present in the uh, painting. What is very difficult for this problem is that first of all uh, when you take uh, you know a region uh, that's about uh, uh, contains a mixture of uh, pigments and pigments have several chemical elements, therefore you get a lot of these pulses and very often the pulses may overlap. And then if you have very nearby pulses, you see like a large, maybe single pulse. And then the difficult question is to work out whether what we're seeing is a single pulse, so a single chemical element, or maybe two pulses and therefore two chemical elements. So that's one first difficult type of decision that one has to take automatically. Important pulses, especially for information related to what is underneath the painting, are very weak so very small amplitude and so they end up being covered by noise and then again you are faced with the difficult decision of trying to work out whether what you are seeing is just noise or is a weak pulse so uh, how do we uh, the other thing is i would like to have an algorithm that in some sense uh, can give confidence to the art curator that what the curator is seeing makes sense so the method that we have is a method that takes uh, the uh, uh, data cube input there is a calibration step which is used to make sure that the algorithm provides always the same consistent result, even if you change the device that you use to get the uh, data cube. And then the core of the algorithm does this pulse detection and localization, and then it maps it to the chemical element. And the algorithm, in order to be more interpretable, produces two different outputs. One is the quantity map that I mentioned before, and then there is a confidence map where each pixel is a value from zero to one. And uh, the higher the value, the higher the confidence that the algorithm has that what it is seeing is genuinely that, that element. Uh, the method that we developed is, as I said before, really model-based and is really based on the fact that we can precisely model or if you want sketch the ideal signal that we expect to see. Uh, because first of all, we understand that the signal is made of a stream of pulses at different location. But the important thing is that we also know the shape of the pulse uh, because the shape of the pulse depends on the physics of the process that I described before and also on the distortion that the device itself introduces. And these are two things that we can model precisely and that leads to a shape five that we know. That allows us to say that the idealized signal is a sum of pulses and I insist that I know this shape plus some noise. And so based on that, we just need to work out the location of these pulses and their amplitude. And we know that the amplitude must always be positive, okay? Because the physics of the process always create positive uh, pulses. So based essentially on this uh, prior uh, information, 
The idea of the algorithm is to generate many idealized signals like this one here, and then play with different locations until you end up with an idealized signals that is uh, fitting very well the raw data that you have access to. And that's really, in some sense, the basic idea of the approach. The pulses that you generate must all be positive, otherwise you contradict the physics. Uh, uh, but then once you find the best fitting, then you decide that these are your real pulses and the location that you found are the correct locations. Now, what I'm describing in broad terms is what people would call an exhaustive search type of approach, because you really try all the possible uh, combinations. And in practice, that's not feasible. Exhaustive algorithms have huge complexity, exponential complexity. And so you cannot use them when uh, running uh, uh, algorithms on large data. However, what is powerful is that through our modeling, we are able to convert this apparent exhaustive search problem into a problem that can be solved using uh, matrix theory, in the sense that we can design a proper matrix based on this prior information. And then we just need to look at the null space of this matrix to work out the location of these pulses. So the power thing is that the algorithm itself is actually a relatively simple algorithm, which can be implemented very quickly. Okay, once you found all the locations, then the question is, okay, we found the location of the pulses and their amplitudes, we need to work out which element they belong to. And remember that we know the idealized locations of chemical elements based on the table I showed you before. So to work out how to assign the elements, but also to decide the confidence in our algorithm, we use some bounding techniques, which are very commonly used in statistics known as kramer rao bound techniques. But the basic idea is that if we find a pulse with a very large amplitude, then we expect that the location we find has a very small error. And therefore we have a very small uh, uh, um, uh, interval which we allow the pulse to be. Whereas if we uh, have found a small pulse, that means that there was a lot of noise. And so we allow the algorithm to make bigger errors. So we allow a larger uncertainty. So based on this, we oops, sorry, based on this, uh, we then uh, map. Okay, sorry, I cannot do the animation. That map, uh, 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 yes, sorry, here we go. We map our pulse with the element, and if the element is within the uncertainty, then we uh, allocate that pulse to that element, and we have a confidence which is related essentially to this distance and to how broad was our uncertainty that we have decided. So in this simplified example, this is a large pulse and yet is not close enough to this element. So it is not assigned to that element because we don't think that actually that's the correct element. Okay, let me show you now visually a few results and then we analyze the algorithm together. So here is an example on uh, the flowers of Van Gogh. That's a painting that belongs to the National Gallery. And these are the elemental map that we have extracted. Uh, let me now go back to um, Leonardo da Vinci, the region of the rocks, and let me focus on this uh, panel highlighted here, which is sort of more interesting. And let me focus on two elements, which were already mentioned before, copper and zinc. So when it comes to copper, this is the elemental map that we uh, extract. Um, and uh, as you can see here, we extract a quantity map, but also confidence that tells us how confident we are about the copper that we found. And when we extract the zinc map, then we see something more interesting, which was highlighted before. Uh, we can see clearly the shape of an angel. So you can see the wings and the head of the angel. And here there is actually the Christ, okay, for those who have a good eye. And obviously this is a composition which is uh, different from the final composition because that uh, uh, is not visible at all in the visible painting. Uh, we also have the confidence map and you can see that the algorithm feels very confident about the underdrawings that have been found. Now, let me try and analyze the algorithm to give you the idea of the difficulty of making things automatic. And so first of all, let me focus on this pixel here, pixel A. This is the corresponding XRF data that we obtain. And again, let me focus on these two elements. Why am I doing that? That's because if I look at the copper, we expect two pulses to be at these two locations, and they are very close to the location of a zinc pulse. And so it is very easy that the zinc could be overshadowed by the copper. So if I focus on pixel A, we can see that there is a clear pulse here, okay, which is also found by our algorithm, which is due to the copper, and another clear pulse here, which is also due to the copper. But then the algorithm decides that there is also a pulse here, 
which is assigned to the zinc. And the value here is very small. The black line is the raw data. And you can see that it's a little bit difficult to decide whether what we are seeing is just noise or whether there is an underlying uh, chemical element. The algorithm decides for the chemical element, for the zinc. And obviously, by visual inspection, we agree that there is zinc there because it's clearly related to the wing. And the confidence, again, reinforces this statement. Now let's look at another pixel, which is very interesting from an algorithmic point of view, probably less exciting from an investigation point of view. So let's, this is pixel B here. Okay, this is in a region here, which is related to the drape of the virgin in the visible part. Uh, uh, um, and uh, clearly this region here contains a lot of copper, as you can see here. Now, if I look at the XRF signal that uh, uh, is generated at this pixel, now the copper has two huge pulses, all right? Because there is a lot of copper here. So you can see this is one huge pulse, which I had to cut. There was no room to show it. And obviously our algorithm can find it. So that's the peak we find. And then there is a second pulse here. But what is it, it is interesting is that the algorithm decides that there is another pulse here, which is assigned to zinc. And again, you can see that if you look at the black signal, okay, it's difficult to decide on whether what we are seeing is just a single big pulse or whether there is a small one here. But the interesting thing is that the algorithm consistently finds zinc in this uh, region and consistently has a certain confidence that there is something there. Uh, uh, this region is azurite, as was mentioned before, contains azurite. This, uh, uh, and uh, uh, it was, is, it, so it is conceivable that zinc is present there, but it's not something that uh, uh, the curator can be sure about. But we're lucky enough to have a cross section in that region, which has then demonstrated that there is zinc in this region, and that therefore the algorithm was actually correct. Okay, here I'm just showing the results over three panels. Okay, so these are the zinc map that we find on the three panels. And here you can see them against the actual uh, visible painting to see how the composition is different. Uh, the major thing that I want to highlight here is these are three panel taking a three in some sense different times. And yet the algorithm produces a consistent result. Uh, and the fact that consistently the same type of quantity, the same type of confidence is produced, give confidence to the curator that what the curator is seeing is something that is correct. Okay, let me spend the last few minutes talking about a, uh, another problem, which is still a demixing problem, which is highlighted in this example here. This is a different painting. This is Don Isabel de Porcel, which is still a painting of the National Gallery. And so this is one of the, for example, uh, uh, quantity map that we extract with the XRF method. And you can see from here, this is the lead map. You can see from here uh, that uh, uh, there is a hidden figure underneath the, uh, the uh, surface. So clearly there is a previous painting and then there, there is a new painting uh, on top of that. Now, because both painting contains the same elements, right? the uh, uh, method that I mentioned before is not able to separate them, to disentangle them. We would be able to do that if the two paintings have, have different chemical elements. So we need to develop a different type of method to separate these two uh, features. And this problem is even more evident if I just focus on X-ray. So here you can see the mixture of the X-ray and that's the visible uh, uh, image. So we'd like to extract two separated X-ray, one which would be related to the painting which is visible, so to Donna Isabel, and the other uh, related to the hidden painting. This problem is extremely complex to solve. We cannot really model physically uh, this uh, complete overlap, okay? And uh, extracting the two uh, uh, um, figures require the use of artificial intelligence methods. So here we developed a data-driven method to try and address uh, uh, this uh, uh, problem. And the idea here is to use the visible image to help us in this uh, separation problem because the intuition is that obviously the X-ray of the painting in front that we extract should be sort of correlated with the visible image so that whatever is left should be related to the hidden uh, figure. Uh, as I mentioned before, we use a data-driven method. We use a, a deep learning type of approaches. Now, the difficulty in this case, which is a problem which is, we are facing many similar cases, is that there is no ground truth data. We don't have access to the ground truth separated images, so we cannot train the method using ground truth data. And so we have to use what is known as a self-supervised approach, which is implemented with a, uh, a neural network, which is based on autoencoders. 
So let me give you a high level idea of how this architecture is built. So the input to our machine learning algorithm, machine learning based algorithm. So the input is the RGB uh, image and the mixed X-ray. And then uh, there is a first neural network, which is shown by these two arrows. So these are two different neural networks that try to extract features. This is related to the RGB and this is the feature related to the X-ray. And we want the feature to be such that if I take the difference between these two features, I end up with a new set of features which model exactly the uh, painting underneath. And then we use another set of a neural network to resynthesize the data from these features. So the blue network should reconstruct the RGB image. The pink network should reconstruct X-ray images from these features. So in this case, should reconstruct the X-ray image related to the painting in front. This should reconstruct the mixed X-ray. And this one should reconstruct the X-ray related to the uh, hidden uh, image. Uh, and then we recombine the two separated X-ray and we expected that the resynthesized mixture is as close as possible to the ground truth mi mixture. So essentially we then uh, uh, ask the algorithm to update all the parameters of these uh, uh, networks by making sure that the resynthesized RGB is as close as possible to the true RGB. As I said, the combined separated X-ray, when we combine them back, leads to something which is as close as possible to the mixed X-ray. And then we also add a new cost or a new loss function, which is known as exclusion loss. And that's based on the idea that if I extract two X-rays, these are two uh, 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 portraits, right? So for example, two faces. So if we look at the contour of the two faces, we expect them to be extremely different because they are two different people. And so we have a loss function which tries to maximize the difference between these contours. So based on all, on all this, uh, the algorithm updates all the parameters of these various uh, uh, networks. So that's done uh, uh, by the machine itself. So that's why it's a sort of artificial intelligence approach. And then the machine based on that is able to provide this type of separation. So remember, this is the RGB input. This is the mixed X-ray. And these are the two separated image. So uh, uh, the frontal layer, and this is the image in the back. The construction is obviously not perfect, but given the difficulty of the problem, the result seems, at least to us, quite uh, satisfactory. OK, so let me conclude here very briefly by just saying that for people working in my area, so people interested in algorithms and in image processing, uh, uh, this is actually a very exciting area because the cultural, cultural heritage sector is experiencing a digital revolution with all this huge amount of data that they are producing and all this multimodal data that needs to be correlated in some ways. And there are many interesting computational problems like this, the mixing separation problems, material categorization, et cetera. And also we try to leverage everything that we have in order to develop effective algorithms. So we try to use domain knowledge. So the knowledge of the creator uh, um, and experts in the uh, heritage sector. We try to understand the physics of the problem and use physical laws as much as we can and incorporate them in the algorithm. And finally, we then ask the algorithm to learn whatever we are not able to learn by itself through the data in order to achieve the best possible results. Thank you. I think uh, that more or less covers uh, what I wanted to, to cover. And as mentioned before, this is joint work with UCL, the National Gallery and Imperial College London. Great. Thank you both. Um, seeing if we have any questions, um, I don't see any in the Q&A function. Just want to encourage anyone, uh, if you have questions, there's the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen where you can um, pose questions and I can ask the speakers. Um, I did see one in the chat. It's more of a general question, um, I guess more for uh, Catherine, um, asking about how uh, one can work as a scientist at the National Gallery and whether um, it's sort of restricted to chemists or if a more physics-based background is something that um, one could use to get into that sort of work. Um, I, yes, I think, I mean, it, it's, it's a very interdisciplinary field. So people coming with different backgrounds is incredibly valuable because it's bringing different experiences from different sectors into this problem, which as Pierre Luigi has said is, in some ways a very complicated type of problem and so yes physics biology you know people coming through conservation backgrounds so we, we have a broad range of people in the department or 
now or um, in the past. So yes, a range of backgrounds. And increasingly, as Pier Luigi is saying, uh, computational expertise is also um, becoming very increasingly important because we have so much data that the kind of old approach of looking at individual pieces of data is, is not really feasible in many cases. Ah, okay. Um, I do have a <laughs> couple of questions coming in. Well, so, coming in yes. Um, so, I have a question that um, asks what other works, um, and if in particular there are more specifically by Leonardo or just in, in general, or, um, is the gallery planning on exploring next or in the um, Arctic collaboration as well? Um, so the the, the reason that we re-examined the painting, I mean, not was partly because we had new technology, but it was also partly because of the um, anniversary of Leonardo's death. And the um, the companion piece in, in Paris was also looked at um, by our colleagues in Paris. And so the kind of the next immediate piece of work we want to do is to compare the information that we have from both paintings, because they've also undertaken um, a range of um, spectroscopic imaging. So I think that will be the next focus will be to try and um, compare the, uh, the two sets of data. And given that they, some of those were taken with the same or different instrumentation, it may also be that it would be interesting to try um, some of the approaches that we're developing in the Arctic project um, in that collaboration with colleagues in Paris. So I think, I think that's the, the, next, the next in line. Great. Um, I have a question here that I think both of you can speak to from uh, your perspectives is um, how does one manage to overlap or correlate between a visible image and XRF images? And what challenges might be involved with that might be something to speak to. <laughs> okay, maybe I, I start. Yeah, I was gonna say, I'll pass that to you then. <laughs> Okay, so I okay overlap can mean two, two things. Yes, so the yeah. first question is to, to do what we call registration. So to make sure that the two data sets are fully aligned. Uh, and that's something that, okay, uh, we did beforehand for this problem. And uh, it's done by the National Gallery, I think is in part done manually in that case. Uh, we're planning to also develop automatic method to fully align uh, uh, different modalities and also to try and align the resolution if we can. That's the first question uh, in some sense. I guess maybe the other question, I'm not sure whether that was the idea. But the other question is, uh, how can we align the features, right? Because in the method that we developed, we tried to extract features uh, and the hope, for example, from the RGB, and the hope is that these features can be used to recreate, in some sense, the uh, uh, X-ray image. Uh, and so now here we use both the X-ray and the RGB. And so the hope is that, so th this is based on what we call an autoencoder. So the autoencoder is a system that given, for example, an image creates features and then is able to reconstruct the image from the features uh, and uh, cre recreates photorealistic images. Uh, so now by doing this with both modality, we hope that the features will encapsulate simultaneously all the essential features of the RGB data and of the X-ray uh, data. And then when you resynthesize things, you use two different uh, arrows, if you want to resynthesize uh, the two different modalities. And so that the hope is that when you resynthesize, the features that correspond to RGB are only used to RGB and the other are only that have been extracted only used then for uh, the X-ray. Um, I hope that gives a broad idea of, of uh, the way we, we address that. Great. Um, I have one here that's a bit more of a broad and future looking uh, question, which is, you know, if the National Gallery or other um, institutions and museums are, are sort of moving in the direction of using digital representations, or I guess, as this uh, person said, holograms uh, to sort of conserve or present the art or how that might play a role in, in how galleries go in the future. I mean, I, th I think that the need to, to see and experience paintings in their kind of original form is always, is always going to be there. But these technologies can be extremely useful in, well, as, in creating a recording at a particular point in time, um, because paintings do 
change over time. I mean, hopefully very gradually, um, but there may be more, more obvious changes maybe related to conservation treatment. Um, so they may have, have a role in kind of recording a before and after condition. They're also useful to record as, as a way of, um, of doing kind of digital reconstructions, trying to understand some, how a painting might have looked in its original. Um, I mean, a lot of these paintings were, were not intended to be displayed in the gallery. They had a, an original context to, to try and recreate them in that context. So I think they're very valuable tools. I don't think we're going to disappear the gallery at any time, but it's 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 a way of, well, I suppose it's a way in lockdown of getting things available to people as well. But um, I think that they're, they're a tool, but then they're not going to replace, uh, I think. Great. Um, I have one more question here and that'll probably bring us to the end of time. Um, this question is about just kind of broadly um, attribution and sort of how what processes are involved in that and I guess potentially how some of this work might, might feed into that and the person asking the question brought up some of the recent research for example on the Salvador Mundi and how um, that has been uh, attempted to be uh, attributed to Leonardo or not. Um, I mean I, I think I sort of slightly alluded to that in terms of the um, the suggestion that perhaps the sequence of painting of the, the London and Paris versions of the version of the rocks may may be different from what is the sort of accepted um, norm. It's not just it's not just reliant on technical um, evidence. So technical evidence is another piece of the sort of jigsaw of information that comes into questions about attribution. So that you've also got um, a, a large amount of kind of documentary provenance, historical information. You've got um, the expertise of um, curatorial and historical colleagues in terms of looking at paintings, style, things that you know, we're not necessarily going to have to measure with, with any instrument. Um, but that's also an area where, in fact, AI is, is often helping to you know, sort of develop this idea of trying to recognise or to quantify some of the things that, that our stories are perhaps managing to yeah, intrinsically are reading. Is there some? Is it possible to capture that process in order to use that to look? So I think I think technical examination is is providing more information. These methods that we we're talking about today provide information from below the surface, which can be very important in understanding exactly what materials were used, without having to take samples, seeing if you're getting changes, how the artist is working, and the more objects that are analysed, the more you use you'll see trends in, in an artist's technique, the introduction of certain materials. So I think it's, a, it's, it's adding to the body of knowledge, but I don't, the technical examination is just part of it. It's not, it's not the complete answer. Great, that sounds good. Um, I think we will call the Q&A session there. So with that, I would like to um, thank both of our speakers, Dr. Catherine Higgett and Professor Pierre Luigi Giorgotti, for such informative presentations and for the QA session. Um, just reminding everyone that a recording of this webinar will be put up on the IMSC YouTube channel very soon, and you can find a link for that in the chat function. And the uh, next upcoming webinar in the series will be on the 14th of June at 2 p.m. And the theme for that is micro and macro FTIR spectroscopy and imaging for heritage science. And that will be presented by Dr. Francesca Rossi and Professor Sergei Kazarian. Um, so with that, thank you all for attending. Bye. Bye.